Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to mourn the death of the NASCAR playoff format. You had a good run? How's it going, y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove. Let me, let me take this off. There were enough theatrics in the race itself. Y'all don't need any extra theatrics from me. We gotta roll our sleeves up for this one, folks. There is so much to say after tonight's controversial race at Martinsville Speedway. We will cover everything, I promise you. First, we have to thank our sponsor. Prairie City Bakery's ooey gooey butter cakes are the ultimate race day snack. Rich, buttery goodness in every bite. If you have a sweet tooth like me, this will be like a victory lap for your taste buds. Ooey gooey butter cakes are found conveniently in convenience stores nationwide. So whether you're on your way to the racetrack or watching from home, grab a few ooey gooey butter cakes and make your race day snacking a big win. Tonight, we witnessed the best and the absolute worst of NASCAR's current playoff system. I want to start with the best because I don't want what Ryan Blaney just did to get swept under the rug. For the second consecutive season, Ryan Blaney entered this Martinsville race below the playoff cut line. Tonight, Ryan Blaney had to win. No points racing, throw that out the window. Win at all costs. That was the mission. Blaney came through in the clutch one year ago. He did it again tonight. Caution comes out with 102 laps to go. Jonathan Hassler calls Ryan Blaney to pit road. They opt to put four fresh tires on that car, losing some track position. Then they lost additional track position during the weird start-stop. NASCAR race control asleep at the switch once again. A wheel falls off Kyle Busch's car, but rather than wave the restart off, they ran like 100 feet before putting the yellow light back on. And in those 100 feet, Blaney lost like two positions on the restart. He was pissed afterwards. He was furious, called it an effing clown show. Red hot steaming. Ryan Blaney was 10th with 87 laps to go. 87 laps sounds like a long time. It is at most tracks, not at Martinsville. This is a 500 lap race. We're in the home stretch here. In those 87 laps, Blaney drove from 10th to 1st, picking off playoff drivers. Some of them also had fresh tires. He picked off Denny Hamlin, then gets by William Byron, chasing down Kyle Larson, then Chase Elliott. 14 laps to go, William Byron completes the pass on Elliott, gets the lead, his long run speed, his determination paid off. What an impressive performance. Ryan Blaney locks into the championship four, had to win this race, and he did it. Team Penske does it again. Joey Logano, fuel mileage at Las Vegas, Ryan Blaney on raw speed at Martinsville. Extremely impressive. This, again, is the playoff format at its best. High stakes, the best drivers rising to the occasion under immense crushing pressure. We saw Tyler Reddick do something superhuman in a similar situation last week. Tonight, in my opinion, those final 87 laps were borderline superhuman from Ryan Blaney. That's the playoff format at its best. So I wanted to start with that because Ryan Blaney deserves a ton of credit for once again getting it done in the clutch. Remember like two years ago, that was the knock against Blaney. Yeah, he's good, consistent, doesn't win enough, isn't clutch. People tried to pin last week's loss on Blaney. I think Reddick just went and took it. That narrative is dead. Ryan Blaney is clutch. Team Penske is clutch. Let's put those old, tired Blaney narratives to bed once and for all. Congratulations to Ryan Blaney. He joins his teammate Joey Logano in the championship four. But now, what most of you have been waiting for, let's talk about the worst of the NASCAR playoff format put on full display in the final few laps. Let me paint the picture for y'all real quick. Blaney is out in front. If he wins this race or if second place Chase Elliott wins this race, they lock into the championship four and either Bell or Byron will get bumped out. Bell and Byron are separated by only a couple of points. Christopher Bell is one lap down. There is nobody in front of him that he can pass for position. So he's hoping William Byron loses a couple spots. And he did lose one spot to Bell's teammate, Denny Hamlin. Hamlin worked his way past Byron. One point separating Byron and Bell coming to the white flag. Byron has two Chevy drivers, Austin Dillon and Ross Chastain, side by side behind him. Not just on the white flag. They were side by side behind Byron for like the final 10 laps. But 
weren't passing each other and weren't passing William Byron. You could see Keselowski, then Logano, host of our other cars getting stacked up behind this group, trying to go forward, but not having the space to do so. Dylan and Chastain do not pass Byron. In fact, they never even got side by side with William Byron, but behind them, much further behind them, Bubba Wallace slows down, radios his crew. I think I have a tire going down. On the last lap, Bubba, way slow, gets passed by Christopher Bell, getting Bell that one point he needs to beat, or actually tie, he has the tiebreaker, William Byron. But as he's passing Bubba Wallace, uh, Bell overdrives turn three, slips up into the outside wall, gasses it up momentarily, and rides the wall in turn four to hold his position. As they cross the line, they tied. Byron and Bell tied in points. Again, Bell owns the tiebreaker, had the best finish in this round. Bell is through. Christopher Bell, back in the championship four for the third consecutive year. Byron, not quite good enough. But anyone watching this race immediately smelled something fishy. Oh my goodness. Because again, two Chevy cars would not pass William Byron, clearly faster, had opportunities, refused to even pull up next to Byron. NBC played a radio transmission from Austin Dillon's team where you hear someone on the team ask, does the one crew chief know the deal? The deal? What's the deal? That's a little sus. And it was also sus that Bubba Wallace randomly slowed way, way down on the final lap, giving his Toyota teammate the one position he needed. And on top of everything, Christopher Bell briefly riding the wall, that's frowned upon. Sure, Ross Chastain went viral two years ago for a similar move, but NASCAR afterwards came out and said, hey, that's no longer allowed. That's a safety concern. Fair enough. So how would NASCAR rule on this Christopher Bell move? In my opinion, what he did was not nearly as egregious as what Chastain did two years ago. Chastain passed several cars with that move. Bell didn't pass anybody once he was on the wall. I guess you could argue he held his position by riding the wall, but I mean, there were differences. So how would NASCAR rule? Would they deem this to be a safety violation on top of all the other funny business? Because NASCAR has also cracked down ever since Richmond 2013 on teams making deals, manipulating the ends of races, letting guys go by for position. We've seen this called almost every year. I don't know if it was called in 2023, but remember 2022, Stuart Haas got in trouble for laying over at the Roval. I don't remember exactly what it was, but NASCAR penalized them then. What were they going to do here? There was a crap ton of blatant race manipulation at the end of this thing. I am fully convinced that Bubba Wallace intentionally slowed up to let his Toyota teammate by. I'm also fully convinced, especially after hearing the radio, that both Trackhouse and RCR let their drivers know, do not pass William Byron. So both Bell and Byron benefited from some blatant race manipulation on the final lap. How was NASCAR going to decide after I don't know, what felt like half an hour, maybe more, NASCAR finally ruled that William Byron is into the championship for Christopher Bell is out. They didn't reference what was said over the RCR radio, didn't reference Bubba slowing down for Bell. Instead, the tiebreaker, if you will, was Christopher Bell riding the wall in turn four, which I get it. It feels like a convenient cop-out that keeps NASCAR from having to immediately address the elephant in the room, which was, of course, the race manipulation by the 1, the 3, and the 23. Instead, NASCAR can say, hey, we all saw a plane with our eyes. Bell gassed it up when he was in the outside wall to try and hold his position. We've said now for two years that's against the rule. Like, that to NASCAR is the only black and white call to make in this case because all the race manipulation stuff is gray area. Yeah, it sounded like the... Do they know the deal? Radio communication on the three was a smoking gun, but you know, we don't know exactly what they're talking about there. And same with Bubba. You know, Bubba Wallace, I got a tire going down. When Matt Kenseth said it in 2015, we knew it was BS. I'm pretty sure it was BS here, but you don't know. It's a gray area, gray area, gray area. Bell riding the wall was black and white. I, like, I don't think what Bell did was as egregious as what Chastain did two years ago, but per the rule book, I guess it's a penalty. Again, it feels like NASCAR decided to punt the gray area calls down the line a couple days and instead only ruled on the black and white call, which was Bell riding the wall in turn four. If Bell doesn't gas it up there, this would be even more interesting. Then I don't know what NASCAR would call. I mean, what was NASCAR supposed to call? I know fans, I know you guys are already leaving comments. Everyone's furious, especially I'm sure Joe Gibbs Racing and Christopher Bell fans. I'm sure y'all are extremely furious right now. I get it. But 
what was NASCAR going to do? What was the right call? Do you let Christopher Bell in? Maybe you could argue the call on the field should stand. Both teams engaged in some manipulation, some shenanigans. I mean, the way they crossed the line, Bell has the tiebreaker. Maybe you just let the call on the field stand. That could have been a logical call. But like, what, you're not going to let both drivers in? We're not going to have a championship five, are we? Are you going to eliminate both? Championship three, they're both out? Are you going to replace both of them, disqualify Byron and Bell, and, and put Kyle Larson in the championship four? Like, what was the right decision? I think there were only two calls here. I think either the call they made, which is Byron gets in because Bell rode the wall, or they could have said, hey, the penalty's offset, the call on the field stands, Bell crossed the line, for, uh, Bell's in. Those are the only two calls I think they could have made. Either one is right in some ways and wrong in others. Like Either way, either Bell or Byron fans are going to feel completely screwed. So that's, I guess, why I say this is the worst of the playoff format is when teams, team orders, team alliances impact the final laps of these crucial races. If you ever wondered how far NASCAR teams will go to gain a competitive advantage, look at tonight. Because, again, NASCAR has ruled on race manipulation in the past. They have penalized teams late in the season during the playoffs for manipulating races. Yet, despite that precedent, it appeared to me that at least a couple of teams were willing to test it once again. This is why... I get on NASCAR race control for being too lackadaisical, for missing calls, for often appearing incompetent, because if race control was more competent, made firmer, consistent decisions, I don't think these teams push the issue tonight. I don't think you would have seen multiple teams, allegedly, try to manipulate the end of this Martinsville race. The reason these teams took that risk tonight is because... They don't fear NASCAR. They don't really take NASCAR race control that seriously. They said, ah, we'll just push the issue. They're wishy-washy. Let's make them. Let's force them to make a call they don't want to make. That doesn't happen if NASCAR race control is more competent, more consistent. Tonight's race manipulation, in my opinion, just showed that the teams have very little respect for NASCAR, especially NASCAR race control. That's what it tells me. Anyway, maybe that's a hot take. I did see a report Joe Gibbs spent 15 minutes at the NASCAR officials hauler post-race, but was informed that you can't protest a safety violation, can't appeal it, I suppose. So, I mean, the call stands. I don't think there's anything to appeal. Byron is in. Blaney, Byron, Logano, Reddick, championship four. So, I don't even know. Where do we go next? What do we talk about now? Brad Keselowski chimed in, tweeted this. This should be the last straw on the camel's back for the playoffs. Will NASCAR change the playoff format? I have no idea. I'm skeptical. I mean, look at how this round played out. The first race of the round of eight was Las Vegas. A lot of fans were furious that a driver who was 15th in points for the whole season, 12th best average finish, people were frustrated that that guy, because of a fuel mileage race, was able to lock into the championship for first. Like, how is that fair? A lot of fans were frustrated with the format. But then last weekend at Homestead, you have Denny Hamlin, Ryan Blaney, and Tyler Reddick all in must-win scenarios, duking it out, throwing haymakers at each other in the final laps. Reddick with a dramatic last lap pass. I'm not sure that happens without the playoff format. Suddenly the playoff format is being celebrated. What a move, 23-11, championship contenders. Then there's today, where there was good and bad. Blaney's final charge over those 87 laps, thrilling, dramatic, Blaney versus Elliott with everything at stake, great sport. But then there's blatant race manipulation behind them, all the good vibes come crashing down. I jokingly held a funeral for the playoff format at the beginning of this video, but if I'm being completely honest, I don't think anything is going to change. I think the format will continue, and NASCAR will continue to be put in difficult spots like this where they have to make tough calls in these elimination races. That's what's going to happen, I believe. I don't think NASCAR is going to change the playoff format because of what happened tonight. They'll point to all the dramatic racing before the final few laps. They'll point to Ryan Blaney's Herculean effort at the end and say, format did what it's supposed to do. Gave us storylines in October and November that otherwise likely would not exist. So I don't know how fans feel about that. I'll be really curious to read the comments on this one. Wow. I guess we should talk about some other things that happened in this race. 
before the the controversy in the final few laps, this was the best Martinsville race in the next gen era. I will give Goodyear credit. The option tires combined with a an even softer compound allowed for different tire strategy, allowed for some comers and goers, a bit more passing than we've seen before. Shoot, guys actually spun out for a change. Carson Osevar responsible for a few cautions early on in this one. This was the best Martinsville race of the last three years. Take a look at the top finishers here. Obviously you got playoff drivers up front. Shout out to Austin Sindrick, Team Penske all around with a big day. Even Joey Logano with nothing to race for today. Strong run. A lot of fast forwards today. Brad Keselowski led some laps. Some of the Stuart Haas guys like uh, Priest, Briscoe were top five early on. And shoot, Noah Gregson comes home 11th. That's not too bad. Shane Van Gisbergen ends up 12th. Hey, way to persevere. Fast learner, that SVG. But those are your top finishers. Let's talk about the eliminations. Again, Logano, Reddick already locked in tonight. Ryan Blaney won his way into his second straight championship four. And William Byron gets the fourth spot. William Byron has been so good in these playoffs. Check out his last six finishes. Second, third, third, fourth, sixth, sixth unbelievable consistency. He won those three races early in the year, struggled with consistency over the summer, but he's gotten it back here. Late season success. William Byron, I think he's a deserving championship for a driver, regardless of what you think happened on the last lap. If you just look at his body of work over the past six races, look at the whole season, I think William Byron is a deserving championship four contender, so congratulations to him. As for the four drivers eliminated, I guess we'll start with Christopher Bell because of the last lap controversy. Just what a disastrous day for Bell all around. Self-inflicted errors all over the place. All he had to do was have a quiet top 15 day. Maybe earn some stage points. That's all he had to do, and they couldn't do it. Could not do it. Qualified outside the top 10, were not moving forward, then spun themselves out, got behind the eight ball, back in traffic, used some gutsy pitch strategy to get that track position back, collected a few stage points in stage two. That was huge to stop the bleeding, but as soon as things seemed to be trending the right direction for Bell, a mistake on pit road. Left the wheel nut loose, had to pit twice, once again, back of the pack, and you know, they passed some cars, got back up to 15th, 16th place, but lost a lap on the longest run of the day, and from there, they were kind of at the mercy of what happened up front. Bell was plus 29 points above the cut line coming into this race, but he was only 22 points ahead of William Byron in the case of a new winner from below the cut line. Unfortunately for Bell, that's exactly what happened. Blaney goes from last to, I guess, third, wins his way in. So it came down to Byron versus Bell. Byron, so good today, executed perfectly, tons of stage points, top six finish. Christopher Bell couldn't do it. Car wasn't there. Driver made a mistake. Pit crew made a mistake. Just poor execution. Christopher Bell has also been very consistent, very fast in these playoffs, but he hasn't won a race. And at the end of the season, if you're not winning races, I don't care how fast you are, you're vulnerable. Christopher Bell and the 20 team proved that tonight. Disappointing for sure. I think Christopher Bell at Phoenix would have been extremely dangerous, but we won't get to see it after tonight's race. The next driver worth mentioning is, of course, Kyle Larson. Uh, Kyle Larson, six wins on the season, but very up and down. A lot of self-inflicted wounds, mistakes. I mean, this round alone, yeah, the flat tire at Homestead wasn't their fault, but Larson spinning himself out, racing for the lead, that was his fault. Pit crew errors at Las Vegas cost them stage points, cost them a top 10. Larson's finishes weren't terrible in this round. I mean, top five today, but the lack of stage points at Las Vegas and Homestead, that was their undoing. And that's just been the story of Larson this year. Six wins, most in the series, that's great. But in these playoffs, he only has four top tens in nine races. That's not very good. They did not have clean days at Las Vegas and Homestead, and today they just didn't have the speed. I think Chase Elliott was faster than them. Obviously, Blaney was. Even William Byron, I think he was faster than Larson before the contact with Blaney and SVG damaged his toe. Just not a good round for Kyle Larson. Three races in a row where they left a lot on the table, and they're out. Unfortunate, but it happens. Other two eliminations. Chase Elliott. What an effort. Led a ton of laps last week at Homestead, a ton of laps here tonight. They found their stride just a little too little, a little too late. I know they got that win at Texas early in the year, but the nine team never looked like real race win contenders all season. They were always like fourth to eighth, 
which is really good. They had an amazing average finish, but not a lot of stage wins, not a lot of playoff points, only the one win. And I think that hurt them coming into this round, of course. But Homestead, they had a shot at it. I think he finished fifth, if I'm not mistaken. And then today, had a shot at it finish second. Bodes well for next season, at least. We saw shades of championship contending Chase Elliott here at the end of 2024. I'm sure his fans are hopeful that carries over into 2025. And then there's Denny Hamlin. (sighs) Turns 44 years old in a couple weeks, I believe. They just didn't have the speed. Not today, really not these entire playoffs. He hasn't won a race, I don't think, since like April, in nine playoff races this year. I think Hamlin has 26 laps led. That's not good enough. They just haven't had the speed. We saw that again tonight. I talked about Larson having maybe the third or fourth best car. I think Denny Hamlin was the fifth or sixth best car at his peak. I'm not going to blame the fluky piece of rubber getting into the throttle body and wrecking his car in practice. Like That sucks. That was a terrible way to start the weekend. But coming into this race, Hamlin basically needed to win, especially with Byron earning as many stage points as he did. It was boom or bust for Denny Hamlin, and he did eventually get back all that track position. Great drive in the first half of this race to get up there. Good strategy call in stage two to earn stage points. Hamlin was in the top five, top 10, and just couldn't go forward the way Ryan Blaney could, for example. So Hamlin was good this year. I wouldn't say he was great. Pit crew failed to execute in some playoff races, and the team just didn't have the speed they needed to get over the hump. I know Homestead stings leading that race with two laps to go, not getting the win. It hurts especially because you don't know how many more opportunities Denny Hamlin is going to have. He's 44, about to be 44 years old, like I said. He's been eliminated now in the round of eight, I think, three straight years. So he hasn't even been to a championship four in a while. He's got a whole lot going on off the racetrack from the race team he owns, the lawsuit he's a part of, the podcast, you name it. Can Denny Hamlin and Chris Gabehart and that whole 11 team lock in and put it all together in one of their final few years together. This felt like an opportunity, didn't have the speed. Stinks, because you just never know how many more opportunities you're going to get. So Denny Hamlin, Chase Elliott, Kyle Larson, and Christopher Bell are out. Dang, Joe Gibbs Racing shut out of the championship for entirely. Who saw that coming at the beginning of the year? Oh, Groovy Gage uh, just jump scared me. I'm on edge tonight. You not do that? Jeez. Uh, Groovy Gage is powered by Electric E-Bikes. Head to electricebikes.com to learn more. Uh, I'm going to choose to rate this race as if the final lap didn't happen. As if we didn't have to wait half an hour to figure out who was going to advance to the championship for. I'm just going to judge the first 499 laps, okay? So I'm putting that asterisk out there. This was a very good race. Like I said, Best Martinsville race in a while. Lots of different tire strategy. I forgot to mention this earlier, but I do want to shout out Alan Gustafson and Chase Elliott for their aggressive pit strategy in stage three. They had that bad pit stop, of course, where, you know, behind the eight ball, working their way back up, but couldn't get closer than like ninth or tenth. They weren't going to win the race from there. So they attempted basically a two stop strategy in stage three while everyone else did a one stop strategy. And It might have worked out had this race gone green. We'll never know. They did get a timely caution when, hmm, suspiciously, their teammate spun Carson Hosevar. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It helped a lot of other drivers as well, but certainly Chase Elliott suddenly had a shot, and it was cool to see him race his way up there towards the lead, contend for the win. Like There were so many different dynamics to this race that I have to give it a good score. I'm going to go, again, this is before all the controversy, 85%. 85 percent on the groovy gauge put an asterisk next to it if you will that's fine with me 85 percent for today's martinsville round of eight elimination race (sighs) i'm glad i took that jacket off it's hot enough in here (laughs) no matter how you feel about how this race played out can we all agree that we witnessed nascar history tonight like We refer back to the 2013 spin gate as some great controversy, and it was, and it established some new rules, some new precedent. We look back at the 2022 Hail Melon as a crazy moment that, again, established new precedent. We establish new precedents every year, but this evening tonight somehow feels even more historic, even if there is no new precedent set. I'm sure we will all remember where we were and what we were doing when Christopher Bell and William Byron had to sit awkwardly on pit road for half an hour waiting for officials to finally make a championship deciding, a potentially championship deciding decision. I know y'all hate when I do this, but it's kind of my thing. I'm trying to think of like a stick and ball sport 
comparison here and I'm having a difficult time. A great race somewhat marred by an extremely controversial finish with several race teams involved. Uh, I can't wait to read the comments on this one. I'm sure they are flooded with hot takes, passion, all kinds of things that make NASCAR fans great. Uh, thanks for watching, folks. That's all I've got. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed. Helps me out a ton. Uh, subscribe if you're new to the channel. We talk NASCAR, controversies, race recaps, rumors, news, and so much more every single day. Hit that button down below. And thank you to my Patreon supporters. I will be at Phoenix this weekend. That'll be a good time. I hope y'all have a great rest of your weekend. Sleep tight tonight. Get some rest. You're going to need it. It's going to be a whirlwind this week ahead of NASCAR's championship weekend. Thanks for watching, folks. I'll talk to you again soon.